land that is supposed to be used for a particular purpose and they have taken it without proper documents for sure it will be repossessed and as a minister for lands i revoked those titles this is the list that is bringing me trouble getting to the bottom of the land ownership crisis it is a referendum can actually settle a political question or a problematic issue in the Kenyan political, uh, Kenya body politic. I mean, this country has no luxury to waste any money. Eight billion to, to do one referendum. Supremacy battle continues as the governors prepare for the Pesa Mashinani referendum. Why President Uhuru Kenyatta is ranked as the third best performing African leader. And a bonus scale overshadows the U.S. Africa Leaders Summit in Washington, D.C. This is KTN Prime with Linda Ogutu and Ben Katili. Very good evening from the KTN News Centre. It is the 4th of August 2014. The Kenyans went to the poll to vote in the 2010 constitutional referendum. Thank you for joining us. This is KTN Prime. Our sign language interpreter is William Sila. Welcome to the program. Now, CIA Senator and former Lands Minister James Orengo has now released a list of individuals, including senior government officials, he says irregularly acquired land. Now, at a press conference, Orengo said his conscience is clear of allegations that he gave the green light for the issuance of title deeds in Lamu. He says he is ready to appear before any authority over the land, Lamu land saga. Orengo gave the list of over 850 individuals and companies as Lands Cabinet Secretary Chari Tingilo said the government will revoke all illegally acquired land dating back to 1963. With many unanswered questions over the Lamu land saga following revelations by the president that close to half a million acres of land have been illegally or irregularly acquired, former lands minister James Orengo sought to clear his name over allegations that he may have okayed the issues of title deeds in Lamu. My conscience is clear that there's nothing anybody can come with today and say that on this particular day, Orengo gave a directive or a direction or an approval. And here he was spilling the beans. Orengo gave a list of close to 1,000 individuals, including senior officials in Uhuru Kenyatta's government, as well as companies, he says, irregularly acquired land in different parts of the country. This list just contains about 1,000 entities and names of those who acquired land illegally from the Republic of Kenya. And as a minister for lands, I revoked those titles. This is the list that is bringing me trouble. Orengo says the allegations against him are part of a bigger plot by what he terms as land cartels. The cartels in the land sector are so powerful, they're so organized, and in my case, they have regrouped. The CIA senator says the government has no evidence against him. Orengo, however, says he is ready to appear before authorities over the land saga. The purpose of the public have not been summoned. And if I'm not summoned, I am going to offer myself in order to appear anywhere where I'm required to appear or I'll make inquiries. Lands Cabinet Secretary Charity Ngilu is promising more action over the Lamu land saga. Those who are saying that we should not take this land away from a people who have taken it so fraudulently should come out and now tell Kenyans what side of their politics they are playing. Gilu, who was speaking in Mombasa during the start of a cleanup of the lands registry, which will see lands offices in Mombasa, Kuala and Kilifi close for 10 days, says investigators have begun an audit of all land transactions in Lamu. The cabinet secretary says the Jubilee government is committed to land reform and has already issued 1.5 million title deeds since taking over power. So you see that here? Yeah. KTN. 
President Uhuru Kenyatta has been ranked as the third best performing African leader. Kenyatta is placed after Mali's president and the president of Botswana. Edith Kimani now joins us with the details of this survey by Gallup Africa. Edith. Well, thank you very much. And as you've mentioned, Gallup does periodically collate data on different issues across the globe. And this time it was on approval ratings of presidents in 26 sub-Saharan countries. So let's get straight to it. And the first one is Mali. President Ibrahim Keita, who was elected in 2013, obviously he hasn't even completed a year in office, enjoying an approval rating at the time of 86%. A lot of people are assuming that because Mali was so unstable at the time of his election, going through a coup, a state of emergency, and sanctions by ECOWAS, that that lethargy could simply have made them sigh in relief when Ibrahim Keita was elected. And then Botswana, Ian Kama. Transparency International actually says that Botswana has the least corruption in Africa. Now, Ian Kama, who is the son of the first president of Botswana, has been honored for very many things, including uh, maintaining the legacy of democracy, and he's described widely in that country as having a deep sense of justice. And then we come to Kenya. President Uhuru Kenyatta uh, enjoying an approval rating of 78%. Let's not forget that this was in 2013, just after he had been elected. We don't know when exactly um, this poll was conducted, but we can assume that based on what was happening at the time, President Uhuru Kenyatta really opening up State House to us, uh, coming out with his shirts rolled up. A lot of people talked about that, inviting the media into State House. That could actually be the reason why 78%, that is so high. And then we move on to numbers four and five. Cameroon uh, comes in at position four. We're just about to look at that. Paul Bia, who has been in um, office for 31 years and still able to garner a, an astounding approval rating of 70%. And then in Burkina Faso, we look at Blaise Compaore, another one who has enjoyed more than two decades in office, enjoying still, again, 70% um, approval ratings. And then we come to the last five, Chad. Now, in 2006, Chad was placed top of the list of world's most corrupt nations. And this was by Forbes magazine. And so it's no surprise then that the president, Idris De is only enjoying 44% approval ratings and allegedly he was involved in one of the biggest scams in Africa where funds which were intended to counter famine were apparently <clears throat> used to purchase weapons. So that's Chad. Nigeria, good luck, Jonathan. He came in acrimoniously after the death of Umaru Yeradwa, who was a the president then. Um, and a lot of Nigerians uh, were, were asked afterwards how they felt about him running for office. And they said that it was a stab in the back because he really was not meant to be president for that long, seeing as they have a cyclical system of having a president from the north and the south. And so good luck, Jonathan, 43% only. His disapproval ratings, 50% um, and his tenure having been in office for just three years. And in Liberia, Sir, uh, Sir Leif Ellen Johnson. This one is surprising. The only female president that we have um, on the continent of Africa right now tons of accolades. In 2010, she introduced the information bill, opening up the media in her country. In 2009, she wrote off a 1.2 billion uh, foreign commission debt. In 2006, she established the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And in 2010, Newsweek actually called her one of the 10 best leaders in the world. And yet, her approval ratings are still dismal. Her country, unfortunately, does feel that she may have rigged the elections. Of course, these are simply allegations. And finally, um, to the last uh to the last ones, actually, these are just three. The last two, South Africa, Jacob Zuma, not new to controversy. The least of the things that Jacob Zuma has done is incredible, including allegations of corruption. He has uh, numerous court cases, including one on rape, um, and a, a luxurious mansion on teenage pregnancies, saying that teen pr teenagers who get babies when they're young should have them confiscated and forced to go to college. Um, an alleged abuse of bodyguards. And of course, we all saw how disapproving the South Africans are of Jacob Zuma during uh, former President Nelson Mandela's funeral when he was actually booed by his people. And finally, coming in last place, the least uh, approval ratings is Joseph Kabila, who's been in power for 12 years with a disapproval rating, the highest one that we've seen so far at 63%. So mixed feelings um, and mixed reactions from these ratings, but that's as they are.
Thank you, Edith. So, President Uhuru Kenyatta only second to Mali's Bubakar Keita and Botswana's Ian Kama. Well, is President Uhuru Kenyatta really the third best performing African leader? We did speak to a cross section of Kenyans about this report. And this is what they had to say. Uh, nafikiri kama ni tatu bora katika Afrika nitakubaliana kama inchi, ni nchi tatu ziko katika Afrika basi anaweza kuwa namba tatu kati ya tatu lakini Afrika nzima uh, Kenya hii tuna mambo mengi ambayo sisi wenyewe wananchi ambao tuko ndani yake tuna hatujui msimamo wala hatujui mwelekeo unatokea wapi ni mzuri it's recommendable na ningemwambia aendele na asiogope asisturiwe na sauti nyingi zile zina discourage we are behind him kama mwanainzi wa kawaida ule anaitwa hasla mimi ninakata yes ibora first kuna mambo mengi sana yanatendeka hii Kenya na hajali sisi hapa chini tunalia hakuna chakula uchumi ni mbaya vitu hazitufiki secondly alitudanganya kama wazazi ana regulate school fee ya secondary school when you look at the national schools in Kenya especially in western tunalipa pesa mingi sana mpaka tunashanga wanatudanganya kuna school bursary kuna wat na hatuoni thirdly tangu waingie we are seeing no change underground kwa business yani vitu zimekaa kama ziko kwa flat rate mimi nakubaliana ni ukweli sababu for the last uh, one, one year since uh, president aingia achukue hiyo uh, uongozi uh, ile mambo tumeona hata kama zingine kama bado ziko underway at least we can feel it uh, tunaangalia ni kweli anaelekea mali mzuri so President Huru Kenyatta received 78% approval rating. He is the third uh, best president according to that survey. That forms the basis of our big question tonight. And we're asking you, do you agree that Uhuru Kenyatta is the third best president in Africa? We've all listened to Edith and the reasons that are being given. Let's, uh, let us know what you think. Yes, and then give us your views. Yes, I'm you yes on our response to the number 22155. And also join that conversation on Twitter. It has been very much heated uh, across the day today uh, the handles are at ben underscore kitili at linda or go to and at ktm can you shall be sampling those views during and at the end of this live newscast now meanwhile the council of governors says it will not back down in its calls for a referendum chairman isaac ruto says the jubilee government has outlived its grace period the governors insist that the referendum has absolutely nothing to do with politics ian wafula has the details Right now, I'm not so confident to say that uh, they have utilized properly the, the money they have. But uh, I think in future, it will be good, a good idea. But they should be held accountable for what they have uh, already given. They have been given already. They're not doing anything. Like, they, in their first, when they were first um, employed, the first thing they did was to add themselves salaries, which they haven't done anything yet. A rather skeptical group when it comes to the utilization and expenditure by county governments, many even more skeptical on additional funds are being pumped to the counties. One of the ten contentious issues prompting governors to call for a referendum. Speaking from absolutely different pages, Elgeo Marakwet Senator Kipchumba Murkomen is of the view that a referendum at this time will slow down the country's development, while the chairman of the Council of Governors, Isaac Ruto, argues that it is democratic and long overdue. This country has no luxury to waste any money. Eight billion to, to do one referendum uh, and uh, logistically, and it could be even more than eight billion. Democracy is uh, expensive, but it is very useful. In fact, Kenyans should look at this as uh, a, a beautiful idea in the constitution that it is a referendum can actually settle a political question. President Uru Kenyatta assented into law the County Amendments Bill 2014 that created a county development board uh, to be chaired by senators. This to ensure that funds and developments are properly accounted for. The truth is that the reason why governors are opposed to a forum where it brings all the leaders of the county is that they fear that uh, in their own closet they have hidden very dirty things about misuse of public funds, about corruption, 
about mismanagement. It is wrong for senators to come and chair uh, those things at the counties. But that is not the real reason why we are going for a referendum. We are not going for a referendum to remove uh, senators from sitting in the boats. With two looming referendums, Kip Chumba believes that both COD and the governors will have a difficult time to reach a consensus with the different institutions in place, urging them to hold their horses. Come 2017, uh, working together with uh, various stakeholders, both in government and opposition, we can achieve good referendum questions that can be part and parcel of the 2017 elections. If you do it during the general election, Kenyans will get confused. What are they talking about? They are looking for a president. They are not looking for, for, for a law. No, that is a different function. And I expect Murkom and Riali to understand this. The Council of Governors is set to unveil the referendum technical team Friday. It is also reported that the team to be unveiled has already embarked on strategical meetings. With the technical team up and running, governors are gearing up for a referendum, confidently that they will succeed, a move they say is meant to protect devolution. Posing the question, are you ready for a referendum? Ian Wafula, KTN Nairobi. President Uhuru Kenyatta is due to arrive in Washington, D.C. about three hours from now for his first ever visit to the U.S. as president. That is at midnight Kenyan time. The president will be attending the historic U.S.-Africa summit called by President Barack Obama. But now the conference stands in danger of being overshadowed by an Ebola scare following the outbreak in West Africa and the first case ever on American soil. Katian's George now reports from the hospital in Atlanta, Georgia, where the American doctor is being treated. As the U.S. capital continues to receive delegations from Africa arriving for the historic summit, the stage is set for two days of talks, deal-making, and perhaps a few announcements. But down in the southern U.S. city of Atlanta, television cameras remain trained on this medical facility, one of the largest and most comprehensive in the U.S., Emory University Hospital. This is where the only case of Ebola in the U.S. so far is being treated. U.S. Dr. Kent Brantley was brought here on Saturday aboard a private jet after he contracted the deadly virus in West Africa, where he, together with Christian missionary Nancy Wrightbull, have been assisting Ebola patients. The missionary is due to be flown here early Tuesday to become only the second Ebola case in the U.S. Now, the Ebola crisis was not supposed to be on the agenda of the Washington meeting, but with the first case on U.S. soil ever now being treated here, and many of the delegations coming from affected countries, the mystery virus appears to have stolen the show already. I thought that you guys were going to ask me a uh, how I was going to spend my birthday. But President Obama, who was hoping to use the U.S.-Africa summit to begin sketching his legacy on the continent, is playing down the fears ahead of the summit. Folks who are coming from these countries that have even a marginal risk or an infinitesimal risk of uh, uh, having been exposed in some fashion, we're making sure we're doing screening uh, on that end of, uh, as they uh, leave the country. We'll do additional screening when we're here. We feel confident that the procedures that we've put in place uh, are appropriate. Liberian President Ellen Selif Johnson and her Sierra Leonean counterpart Ernest Baikoroma are both skipping President Obama's big party, choosing to stay home and deal with the outbreak, as every nation fights to stay safe. And so for the next two days, the stakeout will continue here at Emory Hospital. A sign that the Ebola virus, which was until a few days ago a largely African affair, is now very much an American headache as well. Jogeo, KTN, Atlanta, in the United States. Let's bring you back home. Mandera County government offices were this morning attacked by unknown gangsters. The gang, say to be of about eight men, hurled grenades at the premise, destroying one side of the building. Leaders from the county have termed this as a ploy to scuttle the county leadership. They now want the national government to deploy more security officers on the ground to counter the rising cases of insecurity in the area.
The pieces of glass from the shattered windows at the Mandera County government offices show a result of the Monday morning attack on the premises. Eight armed attackers are said to have hurled a locally manufactured propeller grenade at offices at 2.30 a.m. Monday while trying to gain entry into the county headquarters. This time around, the way they did it, uh, we should be able to actually uh, know exactly who they are and if possible arrest. Heavy fire exchange between the attackers and area police is said to have ensued, going on for about an hour. Though there are no casualties reported, the incident has drawn mixed reactions. We are extremely committed to continue fighting terror uh, with everything we've got as far as we are concerned. Uh, the national government has supported us with uh, uh, enough uh, security team to try and uh, uh, manage our borders. We have a feeling that an attack on the county government is an attack on the people of the county because this is to disrupt the services being offered by, by, by the county government. Here in Nairobi, Mandera County leaders have condemned the attack, stating that this is an attempt to scuttle the working of the county leadership. Irrespective of the attacks, those attacks are not going to deter the people of Mandera County from realizing their dreams of developing their county. Also, you don't rule out, because of this element of also the clashes, anything can, any, any people can take advantage of the situation and blame it on, on, on the Shababs. The incident comes against a backdrop of perpetual conflict in the area, particularly with the clashes between the Gare and Degodea communities. Security has been heightened in the county as investigations into the attack continue. Shalmomani, KTN. Is there a threat to credit rating? That's one of the questions we seek to answer tonight. Of course, with Bonnie Tunya, who will take a look at the top stories in business. Bonnie, what else can we look forward to? Other than uh, the small matter of credit rating, today is Monday and it's Job Center Monday. And today we're asking the question, are our graduates ready for the job markets? Do their skills meet the needs that are in the market? I have all the answers on Job Center tonight coming up. Friday. That's right, it's Monday, and if it's Monday, it's time for KTN Job Center. What we try to do here is every Monday, we try to have forward-looking conversations about unemployment, job creation in this country to help the Kenyan job seeker get a step ahead in his quest, his or her quest, of getting a meaningful and decent livelihood in this country. Well, today we want to interrogate a very interesting subject that has been brought about by a lot of our viewers. Are our graduates ready for the job market? Are Kenyan graduates job ready that is the question and uh, is there a mismatch between the skills they acquire in institutions of learning and what the employer is expecting and that is what we'll be trying to tackle today on KTN Job Center. Earlier on today on our Job Seeker I spoke to a young engineer who admits that there is indeed a mismatch but there is also a solution. Take a look. <music> My name is Rachel Ngoroke. I'm currently working at Samsung Electronics and uh, spare parts, chain management. That is logistic. We supply spare parts to service centers. When I, I had an interest of doing computer engineering and I enrolled in Kenya Polytechnic University College when I did uh, computer engineering. And when I was in our final year, uh, through the four modules, that you go through two hours lesson in a week. They're running through the whole year. The programs runs concurrently with your school lessons. You pick one day, two hours in a week. For us, we used to attend only on Saturdays, then uh, just for two hours, running through from January to December. We graduated in year 2013. Having done engineering, and what I had in mind is that you have to have five years experience to get a job. That was the biggest fear I had. But now having, a, should I call it, a link between my studies in school and the market, that was the best privilege I've ever encountered, whereby you're able to utilize the knowledge you've acquired in school and uh, 
also get uh, an experience of what the market need. Uh, the market expectation is not revealed to this, the schools that are giving them the, the knowledge on information. At the same time, when you're given an experience to just experience what is being expected in the market, it gives you a very good understanding of what is expected of you. Because what you study in school is very broad and nothing in specific. But now when you understand the need of the market, you specialize in that particular area of your interest. At the same time, you're able to build your or connect yourself to your area of interest, let me say so. There's a lot of frustration, a lot of frustration where by the time you finish your five years engineering course and you get to the market with your application and they tell you, sorry, we need uh, an experience, what have you done, have you not done? By the time you understand the need and the agency that you're in that I need a job, the difference is too big. Some stay for two years, three years, and some end up in a different field from what they studied in school. The link between the need and the studies, they are two big bridge. That's right, the link between the need and what you study is too big a bridge. That is what the young engineer Rachel Ngoroke is saying. And helping me understand this um, is someone who's trying to bridge that gap. I'm talking about Patricia Kingori, who's a business leader for corporate marketing at Samsung Kenya. And what they're trying to do is uh, um, uh, they have accepted that there's this need, but they are trying to meet that. Patricia Karibusana. Asante. Listening to Rachel, there are thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of other young people who share the sentiment, who took five, four years in school. Um, they went through the rigorous of getting their degree and getting their paper. Mm -hmm. And when they get out there, the employer says, you're not ready. What do you say to them? Well, it's a reality that we, we have to face because there is a disconnect mm -hmm. between what the market requires, right. what the private sector requires, mm -hmm. and what is coming out from our universities and our colleges. Mm -hmm. And it's very unfortunate, but we need to participate in the curriculum development mm -hmm. of the universities so that the universities and the colleges understand what we are looking for in the market. Right. This way then, the curriculum is skewed to meet the demand, right. as opposed to just mass production of graduates mm -hmm. who have who do not have the skills required by the private sector. Patricia, this is not just an African market, because uh, Kenyan situation, because you operate in different markets. Yes. And the problem is the same. The problem is the same, not just in Africa. Um, it's it's the same everywhere. Right. You you find that um, from world uh, the records of World Bank, Kenya in itself churns out about eight hundred thousand um, new uh, potential labor right. every year. Right. But the formal sector can only absorb sixteen to twenty percent of that. Correct. What do you do with the remaining eighty? Mm -hmm. um, we need to move from a mindset where you come out of the university thinking that you have to be employed. Right. We need to the embrace sense of entitlement. yes right. entitlement. You, we need to embrace a curriculum mm -hmm. that introduces entrepreneurship so that the person coming out there is thinking what can I do, what can I drive um, as an individual. It, it's, it's, and it's there. Today I met a young man um, who is in his third year. Right. He's already opened up his digital agency. Mm -hmm. He already has 10 uh, small to smart. medium uh, <laughs> enterprises, yes, right. who, who he's giving a service mm -hmm. and he's not yet finished. But Patricia, how, do, how did we get here that we're having lots of learning institutions who are training young people, but these young people are not as equipped as uh, the employers would please? Let me move towards our sector, which is really in the electronics right. industry. Mm -hmm. Um, you find that there is the theoretical part that most uh, graduates will go through in the universities. Mm -hmm. But then there is also a practical element. Mm -hmm. Now, it's not, uh, many universities are not able to cope with that practical aspect because mm -hmm. it is expensive. It mm -hmm. requires that you have the equipment, you break them down and practically show the students how to put them back together, how to fix them. They are expensive. Yes. And not only are they expensive, but in our industry, it's, it, the, in, the rate of innovation is very, very mm -hmm. fast. Right. So you find that even keeping up with the rate of yeah. innovation is expensive. From a black for the, and white TV exactly, to plasma to, to a an LED, TV. to a curved new <laughs> right, HDTV. Right, right. So that pace is very rapid. Mm -hmm. And the truth is that 
unless the private sector supports the universities, they're not able to cope with this. And that's why the concept of um, Samsung Engineering Academy mm -hmm. came in. Tell me about a little bit about that. What exactly happens at the academy? Well, the academy is a one-year course, mm -hmm. which focus primarily on practicals. It has um, four modules where we train the students um, how to repair handheld devices. Those are the mobile phones and the tablets. Mm -hmm. How to repair the ACs and refrigerators. How to repair IT products and printers. Mm -hmm. And how to to repair the um, home appliances and TVs. But with time, we also realized that um, they need life skills. Correct. So we introduced a subject on life skills, where we train them how to write this, how to write a CV, how to prepare a business Which is a plan. a big need in this market. It is a big right. need. Life skills are very lacking. We find that you're getting guys who cannot um, express themselves mm -hmm. or communicate. Mm -hmm. And these skills so are required graduated with honors but they cannot draft a proper letter no they cannot they right. cannot do a business they plan. don't know how to pocket themselves no right um so we introduced life skills into the curriculum mm -hmm. um and then after the one year course we put them on internship mm -hmm. for three months mm -hmm. Um, within Samsung or with our service partners. So they must not all be absorbed by Samsung? No. Actually, we are not training um, in, in as much as initially the need, we realize this as a need within ourselves. Mm -hmm. The graduate can operate in any electronic firm right. anywhere in the world. Is, is it similar to uh, graduate management trainees that we see here? Because obviously all these programs, and they call them different things everywhere, mm -hmm. but they're trying to give the graduates a soft landing before they get to the employer. Yes, but this is a bit more than that. Mm -hmm. Because a graduate can actually get self-employed. Mm -hmm. They can start their own workshop. They can, you know, start their own business and, and do the repair work themselves. Right. Right. They do not need to wait to be absorbed um, into Samsung or into an electronic firm. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing we do is that when they are graduating, we do invite HR managers from various sectors that mm -hmm. require engineers right. so that they can interact with the students and, you know, take up the ones that they feel would suit their organizations right. and uh, take them in. So it's a free-for-all kind of thing. Y yes. But Patricia, obviously this thing cannot be left to the private sector. Um, there's a lot of involvement that needs to be done from all the parties. Let's talk a bit about the system, the education system. Mm -hmm. If you were to give quick recommendations, top of your head, what do you think the education system in this country must do in the immediate term to ensure that at least uh, this bridge is got? Um, in the immediate term, once, I think well, the first thing they need to do is embrace um, an entrepreneurial curriculum mm -hmm. in the system so that the graduates come out knowing that they can go into formal um, employment or they can start their own enterprises. Um, the other thing is that the, the, there needs to be a um, partnership mm -hmm. between the government, between the, organ the institutions, of the, our institutions for education and the private sector so that um, they can better understand what it is that we are looking for and then the graduates come out more suitable mm -hmm. to be absorbed um, into the into the different organizations or to even be self-starters right uh -huh. and I would also say that um, uh, it's it's important that um, the government creates an environment mm -hmm. that enables entrepreneurship mm -hmm. to grow because as right. I told you there's a huge chunk of right. people that we so, that so cannot so more be or less is a thinking problem we need to change the way we think especially solutions towards employment young people must not think I have to be employed. Exactly. But they need to, someone needs to get them to that place that they think that way. Yes. All right. Patricia, very quickly, we're running out of time because you are, you are representing something here. I'll give you a chance for a free ad. What, ex, what, ex, what else do you expect uh, coming out of this academy? Um, we expect that, you see, our vision 2020 is actually that we'll have 10,000 mm -hmm. engineers right out of our uh, engineering academies Correct. which are spread out in South Africa, two in Nigeria, one in Senegal, one in Ethiopia and this one in Kenya. Mm -hmm. And uh, we expect that we'll be able to uh, not only meet our needs in terms of requirements of qualified um, engineers mm -hmm. but also meet the market requirements. Meet Africa's need. Uh, yes, Africa's need for qualified engineers uh, because right now it's really ICT has become a big 
um, factor in our industry, in, wow. our, in our lives. Okay. Mm. That's a good place to wind it up. Patricia Kingori, who's the business leader for corporate marketing at Samsung Kenya, and just trying to uh, help us understand what she's doing in trying to bring this cup. So if you're an engineer out there, well, Samsung would be just your guys to look out for. But uh, if you're any other kind of graduate out there, then you need to find yourself a situation where you can bridge this gap so that when you get out there, you are indeed uh, job ready, as they say. This has been KTN Job Center. The combination of rising insecurity, falling commodity prices, and a shaky horticultural sector has put the country's economic outlook into question. And according to the Moody's Rating Agency, the situation is exerting pressure on the country's B1 rating. T is our uh, major foreign exchange earner, including horticulture as well as tourism. Um, they've all been under pressure, and it hasn't been helped by the Kenyan shilling weakening. But experts say there's little likelihood that Kenya could go the Ghanaian way, which saw its rating fall from B1 to B2 in June. So we do not expect a downward uh, revision of our credit rating. In her estimation, even though the country's key export earners were misfiring, the country has witnessed an increased influx of foreign direct investment, which has offset that loss. The oil and gas, you know, current oil and gas exploration activities are also likely to provide a boost to capital inflows, as well as um, industrial production and the transport sectors, which are gaining from uh, FDI attention. Moreover, the recent successful issuance of a $2 billion sovereign bond has increased foreign exchange reserves, allowing the government to reduce reliance on domestic debt and boosting efforts to maintain a sustainable debt level. Our, our treasury bills, um, we've actually, you know, well, there's been a downgrade from 4 billion to, one bil uh, to 3 billion, which is almost a 25% drop. But Vinita says the government needs to deal with the rising insecurity and practice prudent financial management going forward to get the country out of the rut. Adelaide Changole, KTN Business. A rivalry between local and international contractors is slowly brewing in as the Kenya as the government rolls out mega infrastructure projects. Now the main bone of contention is the allotment given to local contractors with the government seemingly assigning international firms a bulk of the work. But as Philip Keitani now reports, the issue of capacity and ability to turn around projects as some of the challenges local contractors will have to overcome before they become serious contenders. Barely a week after the government announced a change in approach in the country's road infrastructure development to a model that will see road contractors take full responsibility of maintaining roads under the annuity model, local contractors will still have to prove that they have enough capacity to deliver the projects before being awarded any tender. Another issue is maybe the smaller kilometers in terms of 10 kilometers, but they must prove that they can be able to perform. I think that is a condition. So in as much as they are saying, oh, we need uh, this, but the price is they must be able to perform. This comes as the government cracks the whips on briefcase contractors who will want to win bids only to go and subcontract to other contractors who will in turn take long and deliver a substandard job. Under the annuity concession, the contractors will be remunerated through a fixed periodical payment by government rather than through the toll proceeds. The local contractors will play a big role in this project. We have given laws for international contractors, we have given laws for medium contractors and also small contractors. The annuity concession will see contractors negotiate the terms of lending with banks with the option of seeking cheaper financing elsewhere. The first phase covering 2,000 kilometers of small roads is expected to be completed in 2014-2015. And what we are trying to do is to negotiate with the local banks so that they can be able, especially to have the local contractors, get a favorable kind of interest rate. So far, 90% of mega infrastructure projects across the country are dominated by foreign contractors, with local contractors urged to put their house in order before they can win big bids. Philip Keitan, KTN Business. Diaspora remittance in the month of June slowed down slightly as the Kenyan source market slowed down. During the month, inflows fell by 3% to $116 million from $119.6 million a month earlier. KTN's Charles Kitonga spoke to analysts on whether this decline is simply an indication of lower figures in the future. Over the last 10 years, the amount of money sent back home by Kenyans living and working abroad has grown by almost four times. 
They have seen the central bank list these inflows as a key source of foreign exchange to compensate for the subdued exports. Despite the steady year-on-year -year growth, the monthly figures have been fluctuating. In the month of June, Kenyans abroad sent home 10.2 billion shillings, a decline of 3%, having remitted 10.5 billion shillings a month earlier. This analysts say could just be a normal decline and should not send jitters to the economy. It, it could just be temporary fluctuations, maybe timing differences, because overall year on year it's up. North America and Europe, which are the main source regions for diaspora inflows, contributed lesser in the month of June. Kenyans in North America contributed 45.5%, those in Europe contributed 27.7%, while those in other parts of the world brought in 26.8%. This is a slight dip from America and Europe, which in the month of May contributed 47.3% and 28.7% respectively. It is attributable to slower economic recovery from these two major regions. Uh, but overall, the global economy has been somewhat uh, recovering and, and US has been leading uh, the, the developed markets out, out of the recession. Experts also agree that the 16.3% year-on-year growth between June 2013 and June 2014 is comfortable for the country. However, going forward, more focus should be on growing local talent and making it productive within the country through better education systems and job creation. Charles Gitonga, KTN Business. Also, National Carrier Kenya Airways has received its third of nine Dreamliners boosting the airline's fleet capacity. After years of delay, the airline is fast taking stock of its newer, more modern planes as it positions itself as a carrier of choice on the African continent. The Boeing 787 Dreamliner has been heralded as the most technologically advanced plane in the market with global airlines lining up to make orders. MultiChoice through Mnet East Africa is investing 1.5 billion shillings in production of local television content as it seeks to grow its portfolio in the region. The farm will be seeking to produce 60 short films between March next year and, part, uh, and the rest of that year. The term uh, of investment plan for the region. The Mnet is also introducing Maisha Magic Channel into the market through which it aims to broadcast the content on DSTV at an onset uh, of September this year. The bulk of the new investment is content production that will be spent in Kenya, where 85% of the content will be generated. As MultiChoice builds capacity in Rwanda, Uganda, and Tanzania, so far MultiChoice has invested 3.5 billion in content production in the region. The Maisha Magic Channel is a general entertainment channel and will feature sitcoms, soaps, dramas, and reality programming. It will include content made in East Africa as well as content made internationally that East Africans have a specific pre preference for, such as Latin American telenovelas. Finally, Mesha Magic will be a channel made in East Africa and will be screened 24-7 as elimination from the 2015 African Cup of Nations qualifying campaigns, fans have taken to social media to express their anger and frustration at the team's dismal show. Here are some of their sentiments. The Commonwealth Games badminton team jetted back into the country from Glasgow, Scotland. The badminton team never managed a podium finish but had some lessons in the Glasgow Games. They landed at the Jomo Kenyatta International Airport Monday afternoon after their exploits in Scotland where they did not go past the group stages in various categories similar to Uganda and Ghana. Michelle Lee captured Canada's first ever women's singles gold medal in badminton at the Commonwealth Games. Uh, better luck next time. Now, after 11 days of sporting excellence, Glasgow signed off with style with a vibrant Commonwealth Games closing ceremony. The closing ceremony saw everyone from the athletes. In football, Arsenal lost by a goal to.